everyone. Welcome to GlideFast on Air. Today's webinar, the top ways to enhance ServiceNow catalog forms with widgets. I'm Lauren Jankowski, the marketing specialist here at GlideFast Consulting, and I'll be moderating, moderating today's webinar. I'm very excited to introduce you to today's presenter, Jeff Pierce, a ServiceNow architect and sales consultant at GlideFast. Before we get started, we'd like to give you some background information on GlideFast. GlideFast is a consulting firm that is dedicated exclusively to ServiceNow, and as an elite ServiceNow partner, our expert team of developers and architects have worked on both sides of the table, as customers and on the consulting side. Our company was founded by ServiceNow Architects, and we're proud to have a team of over 100 experienced consultants and an average CSAT score of over a 9.6, and many more accolades, as you can see here. We'll be monitor, monitoring the Q&A throughout today's session, so please send in any questions that arise and we'll do our best to answer them. As another perk of attending today's webinar, we'll be giving away a $50 Visa gift card. We'll announce the winner at the end of today's session, so make sure you stay on until the very end. Now, we'd like to hang, hand things over to Jeff Pierce, our presenter for today's webinar. Hi, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm glad to have you here. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Lauren. Today we're gonna to be talking about enhancing your catalog item forms. Uh, but before we get into this, I'm just going to, uh, I just wanna kind of prep the audience for what type of content we're gonna cover. And also, uh, I think we got some poll questions we can throw out there. Um, first one, uh, if I can get a gauge for your familiarity with say client side G form object. Uh, so, you know, if you do any client side scripting with catalog items, um, you probably are. Um, so if you could let me know what your experience with that is, uh, this is just going to help me kind of gauge my technical language and you know, make sure that I'm delivering this most suitable to you all. And also, are you familiar with Angular providers? Uh, so those are things like directives and services that are used in widgets in the service portal. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, answering those questions for us, that'd be great. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on those as, as we go along. And also, if you, I think uh, Lauren mentioned, if you got any questions, go ahead and pop them in the, in the questions panel. Uh, don't be shy. All right. Okay, so uh, this presentation, th this is not going to be, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna be Bob Ross for you. I'm not going to teach you how to paint a full picture and you're going to have something to hang on your wall in the end. Uh, that's, that's not what this is. Uh, also, this isn't Westworld. I'm not going to be telling you some long story about how things were and how things came to be. Uh, that's not what I intend to do. Uh, I like to look at myself as, as Bob Vila. I want to show you how to use tools and how you can use those tools to make an impact on what you're working with. So we're not going to build a whole house in, in one webinar. We're just going to show you some really cool things. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to take those and then do your own things with them. All right, so this will be pretty technical, right? Um, we're going to get into some pretty juicy stuff uh, with widgets and the G-Form object, and it's going to be fun, and hopefully you're going to feel uh, much more equipped after this uh, to do some fun and fancy things. All right, so we're going to be talking about three ways to enhance your service catalog forms. Uh, the first one is, of course, just UX analysis. Um, you know, you can't, we, we don't want to even try putting lipstick on a pig. That's the saying, right? So if you have a terrible form to begin with, let's not worry about CSS. Let's not worry about custom inputs. Fix your form first. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll talk about what you can do just by using CSS alone. Um, and then we'll get a little more advanced and actually replacing the variables on the screen with new custom form elements. Um, and making those repeatable. All right, so UX analysis. Um, so like I said, don't try to dress something up that isn't good to begin with. Um, so I have two suggestions here. We're not gonna focus a whole lot on this because this is you know, really more conceptual. Um, this is for you to do in your organization how you see fit. Uh, but first do the blank slate exercises where you just start with a blank form. Um, you know, and you're going to prioritize what needs to be on there. You're going to try to understand uh, uh, what prior priority things need to be in, the order they're going to be in. Um, and then hold focus groups 
see if that form actually resonates with people. If they understand the language you're using and the, and the order things are in, if the layout is cluttered, things like that. So I've put a couple links in there. Those are some good resources for um, doing those exercises uh, to make sure that you got a good form to begin with. All right, that's all I'm gonna say about UX analysis. Um, it's a lot more to say about that for another day. Okay, um, using CSS alone, I'll go in and do some demos uh, in, a, in a few moments and we'll actually look at the CSS and everything. Um, but what we're gonna be looking at is specifically uh, what to target. We're, we're gonna try to get to know the form elements, uh, you know, the HTML structure of the form so that we know what type of elements and classes uh, to be familiar with so that we can apply CSS effectively. Uh, and then also where to put it, all right? There, there, there are many different places to put CSS in the service portal. Um, so we'll look at where those are and I'll, I'll let you know the pros and cons of, of each of those places. And those links that you see there, those are um, just some uh, websites that have some good examples of uh, of form CSS, you know, doing different things with fields and uh, layouts uh, that, that'll give you some good, some, some ideas how you might want to dress yours up. All right, and then lastly, this is what we'll spend most of our time on is the custom form inputs, because this is where it gets really technical and a little more difficult. But once you learn these techniques, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be feeling quite proud of yourself, hopefully. Um, all right. Uh, so first we'll look at different widget techniques, specifically looking at the G form object and, and how we can access that um, client side. Uh, and that link that I put there, that's, that is a Chrome extension that you're gonna wanna have. So you're gonna see me using that and you're gonna probably ask, hey, what is that? How do I get that? So that's the link. Um, number two, we're gonna see how to make these components reusable. So that's where we're going to get into directives and things like that. Um, Angular providers. And then three, we'll see how we can take those and do some pretty cool things with some uh, pulling in th some third party libraries, specifically Angular JS material or NG material. Okay. Um, all right. So at this point, I'm going to take over and just start sharing my screen. You should see my screen. All right. You should see my instance. Okay. So what did we talk about first? We're talking about CSS. Uh, what can we do with CSS alone? All right, so here I have just our, an out of the box service portal. Um, let's go to the create an incident form. Uh, there we go. Okay, so looking at this, um, you know, we, we got to kind of narrow the scope because there's a lot that we can deal with, right? We can, we can work on the panel here, uh, you know, which is the entire container that it's in. We can deal with how text appears. Um, the more difficult parts are going to be uh, working with the fields, you know, the different variables and um, uh, making sure that what we do doesn't negatively impact other things, right? Um, you can see here, I got a great big submit button. I, I have some CSS in here affecting uh, the buttons. Um, I thought I took everything out before I did, but this was still in here. So I'll show you where that is. Um, but so let's take a look at just a few different elements and where we can put these things. Um, so the first place I'm gonna go is into the widget instance. So I'm gonna, so I access this menu by doing control click right on the, wisp, uh, right on the widget. And I do instance in page editor. Okay. And so this is the instance record, right? I'm not going to go into all the service portal theory behind widget instances and everything, but you know, every time you put a widget on a page, it creates an instance of that widget, right? And then you can edit the options and properties of that instance without affecting every instance of that widget. Okay, so here you have a CSS field in the widget instance. I've got a bunch of stuff in here that I've got commented out and we're just gonna kind of bring those in one at a time. Um, yeah, you can see down here at the end, I've got some button styles that I hadn't commented out. So let's look at, yeah, let's just look at this one first. So what did I do? So I targeted the button class, right? Um, the button class, yeah, so let's get into this. All right, so 
if you've never gotten into your elements inspector, right, you just right click on the page, choose inspect, that pulls up this panel right here where you can inspect all of the, uh, the code behind the page, right? In this panel, I have all the HTML, so I can use this button right here to target something on the page. Right now, I'm targeting that button. So it's a button element, and I see it's got the class of, of BTN. So that, and BTN, that's a common bootstrap class if you're not familiar with it. Um, right, so there's already a lot of styles that, that get applied to, uh, to the BTN class. Um, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Okay, but um, here's the styles that, that I had applied, right? This right here is, oops, not that, but what you see there, that's the, uh, this, this idea, I believe, of my widget instance, right? So it scopes this. So uh, whatever styles that I write are only going to be applied to buttons inside this instance, uh, this widget instance, right? So, so my styles are not going to affect any button on any other page or outside of this widget. Um, so what did I do here? Um, well, one, I just adjusted the border radius slightly with this style. Um, I added a transition on there. What does the transition do? You see when I hover over, it doesn't just flip to another color. It actually transitions to it. So that's nice. Um, I adjusted the line height to make it a much bigger button, adjusted the font size. Um, right, so that's a really easy thing you can do right off the bat. Make your buttons bigger, much easier to click on, uh, a little softer when you hover over it. Um, so if we take a look at some of the other styles that I, I put in here, just as an example for buttons. Let's look at number two. See, that one's much rounder. Um, it, it doesn't change quite as much on, on, on hover. All right. So, so that's, that's one really easy thing you can do to, to give a little character to your forms uh, or may, maybe even make them a little easier to use it is adjust your button styles. Um, let's see here. What else can we do here? Let's start taking a look at some of these other elements. How about the panel? Let's bring the panel styles in here. Um, oops. So I'm not a huge fan of out of the box bootstrap panels. I just think they're, I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just, you see them everywhere, right? It's, uh, so let's, let's apply just a little bit of uh, new stuff to uh, the panel and some of the elements inside of it. All right, so some of the changes that took place, you can see there's no border anymore. Uh, instead, there's a drop shadow. I took off the border radius, so it's just got sharp corners. Uh, put a drop shadow on the title of it, All right? So now this form you know, pops a little bit. It's not just your, your standard old bootstrap form. Um, so let's take a look at what I did there. So you see, I took the border off, set the border radius to nine, give it a box shadow. Did a few things to the title, um, to the short description. Um, yeah, all, all you know, pretty simple CSS stuff here. Um, you know, another thing I like to do is uh, say like, say letter spacing. See what three pixels does there. I kind of like to space out my title a little bit sometimes. Yeah, maybe a little much, but you get the idea. Um, all right, what else can we do here? Um, let's skip that. So that was something I was playing around with. Let's uh, let's update these labels. Um, let's, oops. Let's, we'll bring those label styles back in. So what are we doing to it? We are, oops, where'd that go? Increasing the font size, making it uppercase, giving a little text shadow. So how's that look now? Not bad. 
Yeah, especially with a very simple form or imagine a login form. You know, you might want to really space this out a lot more, uh, make the fonts quite a bit bigger. Um, all right, that's, uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because this is really just becoming a CSS lesson. Uh, let's talk about uh, where you can put this stuff now. So, so here I'm putting it in the widget instance, right? This isn't a bad place to put it because if I only want the CSS to affect what I'm seeing here on this page, uh, then that's exactly where I want it to be. Um, now, what if you have multiple portals and you're all using the SCCAD item page um, and you only want this to affect your portal? So your first thought might be, well, let me put it in my portals theme as a CSS record or a CSS file, uh, but that's gonna apply to everything. Uh, and then, then you're gonna have to get really specific in your CSS just to target this stuff. So what you want to do in that case is you're going to want to set up a, a clone of the cat item page, which I've already done here. I'll just show you. So I made my cat item page, which is an exact clone, right? It has all the same stuff on there, right? But this instance of the SE catalog item widget is different than this one. Right, because that's on this page and this one is on this page. So I'll set up a page route map. Go to page route maps under service portal. And I think I actually already have it created here. Um, so we'll go to default cat item page routing. So I created this, right? This doesn't exist out of the box. So I created one that says for this service portal, I'm going to route from this page to this page. Right, that's already active. So I'm just going to get out of here now. And go back to let's go back to our widget instances right so because that page route map is active i'm actually not on this page right now even though my url says that i was routed to the my cat item page so when i go into the widget instances so this is the one i've been updating right here right this is not this is not the widget instance on the SC cat item page. It's the widget instance on the my cat item page, which we're actually on. So I can just demonstrate if I just change that to my. You see the styles are the same. But if we go back to SC and I turn off that page route map, Okay, and we'll navigate back to SC. We should go back to our default styles. See that, because now we're actually on this page. So that's one way you can, uh, you know, kind of use the same page as what, what other portals are using, um, but only apply changes to your portal. So I'm going to reactivate that. Okay, and then when I refresh this, it's gonna route to my cat item. Yep, all right. Okay, so that, that concludes uh, what I wanted to show you about CSS, right? There's just a few different places you could put it. Uh, one other place uh, we didn't look at here, go to page in designer. You can put CSS at the page level too. So here I'm looking at a WYSIWYG view of the page layout. I'm gonna go up to the page settings. I can also put it here, right? But keep in mind that's, you know, so, so the, I could have also done this, right? Just put my CSS at the page level for my cat item, right? But hey, maybe there's other widgets that end up going on that page that I don't want to be affected with my CSS. Uh, so I would put it at the widget instance level. All right. Okay, enough of CSS, I promise now. <laughs> uh, let's go into working on some custom elements. So there's some questions in there I saw. Uh, what can you do with the date picker variable? What can you do with the reference field? Um, I'll try to get to those. I'm gonna show a couple of other examples first. I think we've got plenty of time here. Um, uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at a, a few other examples that I have prepared and then we'll see if I can get to those. So for these, I've prepared an order pizza form because I'm always hungry. 
and pizza is my favorite. Um, okay, so this is just a very simple form. Do you want pizza? Well, of course I do. All right, what size do you want? I want a large, of course. Any special requests? No anchovies. All right. I'm not going to worry about submitting this right now because this isn't really about submitting requests. This is about what are we going to do to make these variables much more exciting. Um, okay, hold on. We got a couple of uh, questions coming in. Let me just pause here. I'm going to hit those. How about specifying the location of the light source for shadowing? Oh, good question. All right, let's take a look at that. So we're looking at this text shadow right here you can see that my shadow drops down to the right as if there was a light above it to the left, right? So to take a look at my CSS property here, text shadow. These first three, or the first two are my X and Y coordinates, right? So X is going to be, um, you know, if I want to adjust it uh, horizontally, see that now it's all, Darn way over there. Um, and then this one is vertically. Now this one is going to be my spread. Um, here, you know, REMs on this on that property are a little difficult. Pixels might be a little. See, at one pixel, I've got a nice crisp line, but the higher it goes, it spreads out, right? It gets fuzzy. Um, and then over here, my, my color, I always just like to do, I use the RGBA black, and then I set opacity on it. That's kind of my favorite way of doing shadows, right? So I can make this shadow darker by making it more opaque. So that's, that's how the text shadow works. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Jace. Hey, Jace. Good to see you, buddy. Is there any way? You suggest organizing theme variables and such for CSS. Uh, yes, if you make a new widget and you want to take advantage of the CSS colors defined. Oh yeah, absolutely. So some, some, some very basic best practices with, um, with CSS is if you have properties uh, that are defined by your theme here, let's just go take a look at portal so we can see exactly what I'm talking about right at the portal level we've got you, you can have uh, CSS properties defined I've got a couple in here from a past project I was working on where I was specifying colors right because my primary color if I decide it's a shade of blue and then later decide it's another shade of blue I don't want to have to hunt that down everywhere I've, I've put it in my CSS so I'm going to define it once here say, all right, my, my quick primary color is this. So now I'm just gonna refer to primary everywhere. And now I can change this all I want and I don't have to go hunting it down. Um, so there are a few different places you can put this, right? Here's one place you can put CSS variables. You can put CSS variables in your theme record, right? And then in your CSS, you just refer to that. So um, I've actually done that. Let's take a look at um, where was some of that CSS? Uh, it was on oh, the widget instance, widget instances. Let's take a look where I made use of that. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, I, I didn't really, uh, I didn't activate these ones. Um, oh, here, here's actually a very good, uh, here's a good little lesson. So if I, idea, if, if I bring this CSS in, what I'm trying to do here with this is affect a dropdown, uh, dropdown choices, right? So you can see what I did with this one, the background color, I referred to my brand primary CSS variable, right? So whether it's in your widget CSS, your CSS files, your instance CSS, wherever, always make use of these. And as long as you're, I think, is it Madrid? I think Madrid now, or, or since Madrid, uh, the CSS variables are supported everywhere. You know, it didn't used to be. It used to only be in uh, 
uh, your your widgets, I, I think. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, but now it is. Okay, so let's let's bring this in, and, and let's see the effect that it has on my dropdown. Okay, let's go back to my the re create incident form for this actually. All right. So see, it didn't really have the effect that I wanted, even though. If I if I look in here, I can see it's like all these all these select two classes. That's what I'm that's what I'm targeting here, right? So why isn't that working? Well, because this this drop down this actually gets inserted on top of the DOM, so this is no longer inside this widget instance anymore. So if I want this to take effect, then I'm actually going to have to take these. So I'm going to take them out of there. And I'm gonna put these ones now at the page level. Let's see how that works. There we go. Now that's, see what I did? I, I made it much bigger, much easier to click on. Don't you love those drop down menus where like, you're scrolling down to try to hit it. And if you like move one pixel in the wrong direction, the whole thing collapses. Yeah, that's what I was trying to fix here. <laughs> um, not, not actually th these drop downs don't have that problem very much, but uh, yeah. All right, so, so hopefully that, uh, that answered your questions. Um, thanks for those, very cool. Um, yeah, that gave me a chance to, to cover this too. I forgot about this. So yeah, depending on the, the part of your form elements you want to target, the widget instance may not be a good place for it because here, I'll show you. <clears throat> so if I target in on, on this, you'll see here if I keep going to the parent element, eventually, boom, I'm like on top of the page, right? So this gets, it's a it's a mask that gets put over the page and then you have this so that's why when you click outside of it you're actually clicking on this mask and the thing closes so all right we got another question does anything change if you are in a scoped app instead of being in global uh not css wise right css um well i mean yeah it, it uh okay so if you're targeting an element in a scoped widget from a global style sheet, you may have to get pretty specific on your CSS to overwrite anything that might be at the widget level, right? Because, but actually, actually it doesn't really even matter if that scoped at that point. So actually, no, I don't think it, anything really changes that. Um, yeah, um, unless I'm, I'm not quite understanding your, your question, but if it's just about CSS, then um, yeah, CSS doesn't really, you know, CSS is actually already kind of scoped in Service Portal in a way. Um, all right, I'm going to, uh, I need to move on to these other, uh, let's look at getting some custom elements on here. Um, Cause this is where, like I said, this is where it gets really fun. And I would be quite disappointed if I spent this long preparing on this part, didn't have enough time to do it all. All right, okay, so, we're gonna go back to our pizza form, order pizza. Okay, and I had three variables on here and some UI policies, right? Do I want a pizza? Of course I do. All right, any special requests? All right, so this is all fine and dandy. Let's take a look at this catalog item uh, or this record producer, where is that? Uh, order pizza. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'll just give it a moment. It's waiting. It knows I'm hungry. I didn't actually order a pizza, I promise. I'm just trying to open this darn record producer. Um, all right. So let's take a look at our variables. I got a yes, no, a multiple choice, multi-line text, 
and a macro, right? We're going to be, there's nothing special about these. These are just plain old variables. So we're not going to look any further into those. We're going to look at this one, the macro variable. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay. So this macro I said is going to be a widget. Pizza variables, I called it. Let's go to that widget. Uh, okay, so now, now we don't have to go back. Actually, we, we do have to go back one more time because I need to turn that variable on. It was, uh, oh, sorry about that. It's still deactive, inactive. Okay, so we're turning on our pizza variables macro. And let's see what that does. Okay, nothing yet, but if I answer the question, nothing yet. Okay, let's see, well, let's go to our... All right, let's make sure we got this on the page. All right. Oh, we have to reload. Record producer, make sure that that variable is good. Did that save? Oh, it didn't. Okay. I know you guys saw me do that. Don't make me like rewind the webinar. <laughs> I clicked active and hit update. I know I did. All right, let's do it again. All right, do I want a pizza? Yes. Okay. All right, so you see what happened here. I've got something else going on down here. Then I got another thing going down down here. It looks kind of ugly though. We're gonna have to fix that. So don't worry about that right now. Actually, what we're going to do, let's, um, we're gonna just take off that CSS that we were doing before. Cause I think that's kind of messing with us right now. We're not working on that right now. Anyhow, so let's take all that CSS out. Also at the page level. Remember, I'm not Bob Ross, we're not painting a complete picture. I'm just showing you a few different things. All right, let's try this again. All right, okay, so let's, let's take a look here at what's going on. So you can see I have kind of these two um, uh, variables reproduced, right? I got my size and I've got a special request. Let's, let's actually go just one of these at a time here. So I'm gonna open up this widget and let's start inspecting this. Yeah, so Jace will have this uploaded on YouTube. Um, I'm also gonna have this widget here um, and you know all the other supporting files in, a, in an update set for you, uh, no worries. Okay, all right, so let's take a look at what I'm doing here. Let's start, let's start with the client script. Let's close everything else down. Let's not be distracted by anything. Um, let's not even look at this. Uh, okay, our client script. We're doing two things in this, right? So this widget gets embedded on the catalog item form. So now this is a blank slate for us to do whatever we want in this catalog item. First thing I wanna do is I'm just, I'm setting up an easy reference to the G form object. The G form object is everything you wanna know and everything you would want to do with the catalog item form. So let's go in and look at that. So when, uh, what you actually let's what you actually get with this. Okay, so remember I said that, that there's a Chrome extension that you're gonna want? This is it, right? I, I just drilled into an HTML element, which this is actually my widget that's sitting on the catalog item form. I can go into the AngularJS scope of that now. 
I'm gonna go into my scope. And then here, you know, here's some, here are some properties that I've defined. So here's that G form object, all kinds of things in here we've got. Uh, you can get all your fields, you, you can uh, get field names, uh, set values, get values, uh, right? So if I need to interact with the catalog item form in any way, I've got all of these methods that I can use. Furthermore, I can also make a reference to the variables themselves and get some really good information about them. For example, so I've set up this object, this field object, which to, so this is actually synced to the actual size field, right? So it tells me what my choices are. Um, I know if it's mandatory, I know if it's read only, if it's visible, Right, so all of this stuff changes as you interact with the form, depending on your UI policies and catalog or client scripts, et cetera, right? And I don't wanna to have to try to reproduce all that stuff to try to tell if a field is mandatory, you know, based on other fields. Um, so uh, I, I'm able to, to, to know all of that stuff from the G form object, right? So, so that's what I'm doing first, is I'm adding to my data object, the G form object, right? That creates a reference. Um, I'm also spelling out a couple variables that I want to convert, right? Because that's really what this widget is meant to do is it's used to convert existing variables on the page into new ones. So let's take out comments for now. Let's just focus on the size. All right, I'm gonna save that. Now, uh, well, just so you know, nothing in the server script. We're not doing anything server side here. Um, let's look at our HTML element now. I created an Angular provider directive called GF variable embedder or embedder because I want to be able to use this functionality that I'm creating on any variable that I want. And I don't want to have to like recreate everything behind this over and over and over. Right. So Really, if I want to use this on another form with another set of variables, I just create a new widget. Here's my HTML template, and here's my client script. Everything else is in here, right? So this becomes extremely reusable. So let's take a look at it. All right, well actually, before we do that, keep looking over here. <laughs> I'm feeding it my data object, my client side data object. This is scope.data. And this is just a, this is, this is an attribute that I made up, cat data, right? And this is the name of my directive. Uh, so in, in Angular speak, so ServiceNow calls them all Angular providers. Um, Angular providers can be directives, services, or factories, right? This is a directive provider. Uh, so here it is over here. Now, don't let this fool you. This, the way it's spelled camel case is this, right? When you're in the template, it's going to convert camel case to these, to the dash notation um, or however you call that. Um, all right, restrict E, this just means that I'm going to be calling this, oops, by element name, right? So this, this is an element. Right, I could use C, restrict C and call it by class. And then I would just like use say div class equals <clears throat> GF variable embedder. But, excuse me, I got something in my throat all of a sudden. <coughs> mm. Don't worry, I'm alive. Um, okay, where was I there? All right, yeah, okay. So I'm not gonna explain everything about directives here. Um, but suffice it to say, you can also then, uh, you know, this is where I'm linking that cat data attribute to a local object, you know, so I have a locally named object. So now, now I can use scope.data in my client script and in my HTML template. And it's just like scope.data over here. Um, so that's how I link these two up. Um, Okay, and so what am I doing here? For every variable that I define, which right now we're just doing size, I'm doing um, 
well, I'm, I'm getting that field, right? I'm getting the field object from the G-form method. Um, so now when I repeat, which through my variables or my fields, we'll say, I'm kind of using the words variables and fields interchangeably here. Um, so when I'm repeating through my fields, I'm actually working with, with the original uh, field object from, from G form, right? So there's a couple of cool things I can do with that. Here, let's go ahead and close this down now, right? Um, let's see here. So I only want to show this if the visible property is true, right? And that gets flipped on and off uh, based on UI policies. I don't have to script anything else now, right? I just have to watch that property. Um, and so I'm also, I'm switching on field type, right? Because I might have many different variables that I want to, variable types that I want to replace. So I've got two examples here. I did a multiple choice. Um, so when the field type is multiple choice, I'm calling in this directive. Uh, when it's a text area, I'm doing this one. All right, and then that I just, I'm also passing to these, the G form object, as well as the field object. So that's carrying through. All right, so now let's take a look at that directive, this multiple choice directive, and we'll see what I'm doing there. And we'll actually get this working. All right, there's our multiple choice directive. Okay. So you can see it's, it's a very similar format to the other directive, right? We're calling it by element. Here we're, we're connecting up our scope, uh, field and form. I have just a, a simple function here for, for getting uh, style of, um, uh, well, I'll show you what this is doing in a second here. So here, let's actually just go back over here. I'm, but first I need to reinstate the CSS because that's why it wasn't looking right before. And then we can close that down. We don't need to look at that anymore. Let's give this another try. There we go. This is looking much better. All right. So I've taken this variable and reproduced it in a completely different way, right? So first thing you might be wondering is where those images come from. Well, that's just a sneaky little trick. In my image bank, I just loaded these. So there's the, the variable name, there's the choice value, right? And then you can see over here, how do I get the background image? Well, I just take the field name and the choice value and I, and I go grab that image. Right, so that's what I'm doing there, right? That's not actually loaded into the catalog item anywhere where I suppose you could do that, right? You can just extend the, uh, the choice table uh, to, to load an image, something like that. But here's the cool part. I want a medium, it just selected medium down there. I want a large, it just selected large there, right? These two are in total sync with each other. How'd I do that? Because, Two ways, one right there. I set the model of this element to be the field value. So whenever the field value changes, you know, we, we know which, which item is selected. Um, and then this, when I click on an item, I'm going to our, our G form object, which I just passed down here, just as form, right? And I'm calling set value, this field, that choice. Um, right, and then I've got some other things on here. So if it is selected, right, if this value is, a, uh, is the same as the field value, then it's gonna get the selected class, uh, right? So I was able to use all that stuff that I found in the field object and in the G form object to easily keep these in sync with each other. Okay, so now, uh, let's bring in my comments field. Oops. So say I want to do that to comments too. 
because right now we're, we just got this right there. Any special requests? So let's reload it. Of course, I want a pizza. I want a large pizza. Any special requests? Yes, no anchovies. And look at that. See how these two are in sync? Please don't forget. Lovely, huh? And you like this little input? Let's take a look at that. So uh, how did I make this? Well, actually, before we go any further, you might be wondering, yeah, but now we've got like two sets of variables on the page, and that's silly. Well, link. I need uh, I need Legend of Zelda theme music right now. Link to the rescue, the link function. All right. So I commented this out, right? Because I didn't want to show you yet. In our link function, I'm looping through all our variables, the ones I defined that I wanted to replace. And I'm just finding that in the DOM and I'm removing it. So let's take that. Let's reload it. Oops. There we go. Beautiful, huh? Okay, so let's take a look at that other directive, right? This one, because that's a little fancier. Uh, let's look at that one. So that one, let's go to Angular Providers. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna get to the reference field uh, or actually be able to do these, but I can talk through them um, or the date picker with the confirmation message. Uh, but let's take a look at the just the, the text area first. And uh, and Adam, yeah, my girlfriend loves anchovies. I don't. Somehow we're still together. Um, so apparently Adam Chelly likes anchovies. <laughs> um, no offense there. I I, sir, I want this to be a safe space for everybody. So if if you are an anchovy lover, I really apologize. I will uh, try to be more tolerant and not trigger you. Uh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> where are we? Text area. Um, text area. So, okay, so very similar to the others, right? Restrict by element, passing in field and form. Um, I don't have any link in here or, or no no function uh, to put. Uh, I don't need any, need any client side scripting here. It's all in the template. All right, so for this one, I just used a form element. And now there's this, MD input container. What is that? Okay, so this is where I'm pulling in a third party library to create some cool elements. Um, but you can see I've got some of the same things going on here, right? NG model, you recognize that other one. That's where I'm, I'm binding the value of this, but with the text area, you actually wanna bind it to the staged value and not the value, interesting enough. Um, you can set a max length. But that's really about all I'm doing here. Oh, and then also, right, I'm, I'm giving the, the, the label of the field a red color if it's mandatory and it hasn't been filled, which doesn't apply to this. And we'll look at that in a second, too. All right. So, so this right here, this element that might look foreign to you, that comes from the ng material library. So let, let me show you that really quick. Um, If you go to AngularJS material, so material.angularjs.org, so that link is in the in our in, in the presentation. Um, let's go to uh, where was that text? Yeah, wasn't it? Input. So you can go and just browse all of the components that they have. And so so I kind of liked this one, right? Um, I liked how that worked. So I went to here view source and down at the bottom i just saw what you know how, how to construct that um, but that's not it 
I mean, that's that's how I knew how to, you know, HTML HTML elements to use. Uh, but there's one other step, uh, and that is if we go take a look at this pizza variables, and we scroll down. See, we have a dependent. Actually, yeah, let's just talk about a couple things here now that we're here. So, that, right, this is my widget that's embedded on the catalog item form, a macro variable, right? We have to attach the one Angular provider to this widget, variable embedder. That's what makes this so repeatable, right? So I can make, and actually, you know, okay. My, my mind is starting to think out loud here. <laughs> I'm, I'm realizing how this is, can be even more efficient. Um, right, so, so this widget should be very easily repeatable, right? I should be able to name it whatever I want and just drop this provider in there uh, and tell it what variables I wanna watch. And then I just have to attach that provider via Angular providers, right? So I just realized that I have all this stuff here in the CSS, but let's take that out and put it in a better place, right? Because I want this widget to be super reusable. So I, let's just say this dependency that I'm using, ng material, I created it just for this purpose, right? So let's actually go into this and add a CSS file um, to this. Uh, Actually, you know, I'm not going to do it right now, uh, just because I just realized there's other steps, right? Because then this dependency, you can actually set it to, to load on page load, which where I believe that CSS will be applied to the whole page. And really, I really only want to target that widget. So let's not complicate things <laughs> at the moment. Let's just put this, we'll, we'll put our CSS back into that for now. Um, you know, as you can see there, there's many different places to put it. Really what I would want to do is actually base this up a little bit and decide what could be applied to the whole page, what I wouldn't want to be, et cetera. Anyway, let's look at this dependency. All right, so ng material, I gave it this name, ng material. Um, I, I, I want this to load on page load because of the way the library works. So I'm specifying portals um, that I want it to load for. Um, all right, and this has a JS include. This is the ng material JS file, and I'm just calling it by URL. Right? You can version 1.1.19. I'm also importing the ng material style sheet. Now, if you notice the blue here, right, that's coming from the style sheet. If you want to make sure that it's in line with your theme, you're going to want to not call it by URL, but embed this as an actual style sheet. And it, it's actually not that hard to go through here and, and update the colors. I know it, it probably seems like it, does, it is, but like there's actually just a couple of, of places where you would go in here and, and change your color values. Um, so it's, it's not as daunting as it looks, um, but that's what you do. So, so this dependency, right? You need the style sheet and you need the JS file. Um, and I, I load it with the widget, right? It's attached my pizza variables. So, so this widget really right? dependency in these this spider. And then is able to let's go one more time and look at that. Angular provider, the text area. Right, so a lot of this, the standard stuff that you would do with a form, especially in Angular JS, your model and everything, but just like a, a few other things. I can set the max length of it, how many rows I wanted there to be. Um, right, so, so go in and, and do some studying in Angular JS material. It's actually really used, uh, it's pretty flexible, and um, and you do some pretty awesome things, right? That's a, this is just a much funner text box than, than what you get out of the box. Um, all right, well, hey, we're, we got four minutes to spare and 
I don't feel like I had to rush. Uh, hopefully I was able to show you how to use some of these methods and help you understand them so that you can take them and do your own cool stuff with them. Order your own pizzas. Uh, <laughs> any other questions while well, we got just a couple minutes left? No? All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we will, like I said, we'll get the update set published to you one way or another. Um, give me a minute to clean that up. Um, we'll get that out. Uh, oh, Jay, are we participating in the hackathon? What are we doing for K20? Uh, we have several social conferencing events happening, I know, for GlideFast. Maybe this would be a great place for Lauren or, or somebody to, to jump in. I think you could probably answer this a lot better. But me personally, in the hackathon, um, I haven't had any plans yet on that. I'm actually kind of in the middle of moving, so uh, my, my extracurricular activities are limited. Uh, moving back to uh, the East Coast. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll get this update set out to you so you can see my examples. We'll get this presentation to you. Um, and feel free to email me, Jeff Pierce at GlidePass. Awesome. Um, I'm Thank happy you. to help you out with anything. Share my screen for a second, Jeff. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, I'm done. Awesome, yeah. And if everyone follows um, GlideFast on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, we will be having a big announcement soon um, in regards to Knowledge 20. And with that being said, um, we are almost out of time for our presentation. So we do want to announce our winner of the $50 Visa gift card. And it is Tom Narsavage. So congratulations, Tom. Um, we'll email the prize directly to you. But if you didn't win today, don't be discouraged. Every on-air webinar you attend for both GlideFast and our sister company, Faircode, will give you an entry into our grand prize giveaway of a mirror, um, which is a $1,500 uh, prize value. So we'll select the, the uh, winner for that in June. And we'd like to thank all of you. I know we're at two o'clock right now. So thanks everyone for attending the webinar. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and definitely um, register for some other GlideFast on-air webinars. And we hope to hear from you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.